and go. Okay, everybody. You're live. Welcome to uh, Hello Biologie, uh, our lecture series within the Institute of Architecture, Technical Technische Universität uh, Berlin, uh, in collaboration with Mansoura University in, uh, in Egypt. Um, we would like to welcome today to our first session, uh, Professor Dr. Martin uh, Dade uh, Robertson. Uh, hello, Martin, we're welcome and um, uh, we are so happy that you, you could make it. Let me introduce you. Uh, professor uh, Martin Dad Robertson uh, is Professor of Emerging Technology and Co-Director of the Hub for Biotechnology in the Built Environment uh, at the School of Architecture, um, Planning and Landscape in Newcastle University um, in the UK. Uh, he specializes in design computation with a specific interest in emerging technologies, particularly uh, synthetic uh, biology. Professor Dad Robertson has been awarded degrees in architectural design um, and architectural computation and synthetic biology as well. Uh, he's the editor of the Routledge book series on biodesign and has completed the first book, Living Constructions, uh, published in 2020. Uh, he has published way over 30 peer-reviewed um, papers, articles, uh, chapters, and so on. Uh, and uh, these include uh, 2017 Architects of Nature, Growing Buildings with Bacterial Biofilms, uh, that was published in the uh, journal Microbiology, Microbial Biotechnology. Uh, then he was a co-author in Responsive Plant-Inspired Skins, uh, a review. Uh, that was a conference paper uh, from uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, as well, um, Architecture uh, of Information Um, uh, published by Routledge in uh, 2012 and uh, and many, many more. So um, uh, I'm very happy to, to welcome you, Martin. Um, we're looking forward to, um, to hear uh, about your work and to uh, discuss your work uh, as well. So thank you very much. I give the word uh, to you, Martin. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen and just check that this is this is going to work. There's always a bit of trepidation at this moment as we try to make this this all happen in the way that it should. But um, you should now be able to see my whole presentation. Is that is that right? Can people see it? Is it looking okay? Good. All right. I'm seeing enough nods to convince me that it's all right. So thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I always start by saying that I'm. I wish I were not doing this from my living room. I wish I were with you guys, but actually that I think we've got quite an audience from lots of different places. So I don't know really where I would be if I were anywhere, but um, we're getting used to this format now, but it, it doesn't make it any easier somehow. So um, thank you for the um, introduction. I, I guess to start with, um, I, I think you gave a really good introduction actually, Lisa, so I, I won't need to go into much detail there, but just to explain a little bit about my slightly unusual background, I suppose. So I have a BA, BA in architecture, um, but I, I did my, my master's and my PhD um, in not a professional accredited architecture course. So I did I existed originally kind of architecture and computing, and architecture and digital media. And that led to my first research um, career, I guess. And then I became interested in probably the last 10 years in an emerging area called synthetic biology, which I'll talk about. And I did a, I took a sabbatical to do a master's degree in synthetic biology, specifically microbial synthetic biology. And I'll talk about what that is. And that's led to my, my first, this, this is the first of the biodesign book series, actually, at Living Construction. Um, if any of you do have any work that you're interested in publishing as a book in biodesign I'm, I'm looking I'm, I'm trying to find lo lots of people to contribute and add to the book series so we have four queued up at the moment my mine one is out it doesn't get very good reviews on Amazon at the moment uh, mainly because it's quite small so it's, it's it's a very small book series and they're about 20 pounds so I think you expect more but um, size and everything so I'm going to use some of the information from my book today but to just give you a, a broad idea of the sort of work that we're doing and hopefully show you some interesting and inspiring stuff. 
So my, my main job is that I'm the co-director of a big, now a very big research center in the UK called uh, the Hub for Biotechnology in the Built Environment. So we are, as of this year, I think we're now just over 50 people. And the Hub, um, we were lucky, we worked very hard for it, but we were lucky enough to win uh, a large, an eight million pound research grant actually to build a center between two institutions at Newcastle University and Northumbria University. And it includes um, bioscientists, um, specifically microbial bioscientists, but it includes synthetic biologists, microbial ecologists, engineers, and architects, and in fact, designers of different sorts. We have a couple of different designers, and we have a bunch of PhD students, postdocs, research fellows, profs, and people like me. Um, the Hub for Biotechnology in the Built Environment is split into four research themes at the moment. Um, new ones are coming online quite soon, actually, but uh, building metabolisms, living construction, microbial environment and responsible interactions. I'm not going to talk much about mo most of those themes, but just to say that the, the overall ethos of our center is for, to develop future built environments which are life sustaining and sustained by life. And that emphasis is on that final part, sustained by life. So what does it mean to have a built environment which is sustained by life? So as well as being the co-director of the center, I'm also, I also um, co-lead of the living construction uh, theme. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. So I'm gonna give you an overview of the living construction theme. It's gonna be a whistle stop tour. So I'm gonna show you a few different things with the hope of interesting you. And, and I can obviously go into more detail in any of those in the questions that follow. Before doing that, I just want to make mention of um, my, my collaborators and my group. So. Um, actually, we, as I say, the, the, the centre is large now, so we're, we're more than 50 people. Um, what I've done here is to pick out some of the, the people whose work I'll talk about directly in this presentation. So I run a group which is much more along the lines of a scientific research group. Um, so we have a, a, a quite a strong structure of PhD students, postdocs, uh, other researchers. We have a wet lab. Um, in fact, as part of the HBBU, we've just um, renovated a brand new wet lab that we're moving into at the moment and an experimental house and all kinds of cool stuff that we're, we're developing. And I also have a lot of collaborators. So I collaborate with people over at Northumbria. Um, I've underlined Mung there, who is my main collaborator. She's also the co-director of the, the co-lead on the living construction theme. She's also my wife and one of the And so that's enabled a kind of collaboration that is actually quite hard to do if you're if you don't really know the person in the way that we know one another. So a lot of her work is in 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 the collaborative stuff I'll talk about. And then we, we're funded uh, well as well. So we're funded by a number of UK funding bodies, including Research England, who fund the whole centre and EPSRC and others. So I wanted to just start because sometimes you leave that to the end and you rush past it. But it's important to recognise that all of the work I'm going to show you is collaborative in nature. So just to place this, uh, I, I guess I, I've got a quite a broad audience in front of me, I, I guess, but they're predominantly architects, possibly architectural designers, kind of a bit of a mixture. Just to place this, the work that we do in, in context for you, and I'm, I apologize in advance, this is very broad brush. Um, but if we start with uh, a, an area of emerging technology and architecture like digital fabrication, which I think we can all agree in architectural design is a, an important and emerging area, we think that uh, digital fabrication has really been enabled by a, a key move or a number of key moves that, that constitute one relationship, really, the relationship between hardware and wetware and import, uh, hardware and software and the coupling of hardware and software together. And I show on the left images that are very commonly shown in these sorts of presentations of examples of the Guggenheim, the work of Frank Geary, that early coupling of kind of expressive architectural form with CAD CAM that enabled those to be uh, translated into to complex structures. Um, and then the image, which is a bit more recent on the bottom left, is a 3D printed bridge produced by a group at Tsinghua in, in, uh, in China. Uh, this bridge was, was produced for Shanghai, where a combination of robotic manufacture with material form finding and so on has been um, uh, used to create this uh, essentially robotically constructed structure. So we see this happening in this relationship between hardware and software as being very important in architecture and the way that fabrication has developed. There is also, uh, I think, well-recognized and implicit relationship between uh, methods of digital fabrication and that coupling of hardware and software and biology. And that's played out in a couple of different ways. And so the, the first one is through biomimicry, uh, using the principles and, pro and, and processes in nature and using those to inspire our design 
uh, outcomes. Um, I, I guess one of the, the, the best known uh, proponents of that is Akim Menges, who's um, uh, a series of pavilions of, of often have a biological source that inspires then a form of digital, often robotic, robotic manufacturer. And then the second theme is biointegration. And, and for that, I show uh, probably the most iconic example of a bio, an architectural biointegration pro, um, project. This is the, the Silk Pavilion by Neri Oxman at MIT Media Lab. If you're not aware of that, that work, Neri has created this um, uh, uh, essentially a, a, a scaffold made from aluminium. Uh, the scaffolding is then woven robotically with silk and then um, is seeded with a thousand uh, silkworms that then essentially complete the structure by, by crawling over the, the, the scaffold and then completing, leaving their own trail of, um, uh, of silk threads. So it's an example of using biology as, as part of the fabrication process, in this case, the silkworms. So there seems to be an implicit relationship between, between biology and, and the hardware and software. The way uh, we see this is, uh, is a, bit, a little bit different. So we see uh, there being a trinity of, of, um, of domains, if you like, not only software and hardware, but we add in what we describe as wetware. And a way of thinking about this is that hardware and software have enabling technologies. So in software, uh, typically in architecture, we talk about things like CAD CAM, parametric design, material-based design computation, and so on. And then that's translated into the hardware of robotics and 3D printing that allow us to, to translate 3D um, virtual uh, models into physical reality. Um, we consider wetware to be living things, living cells, and uh, that too has enabling technologies and our enabling technologies are, are, are based around synthetic biology. And so that includes things like uh, microbiology, uh, genetic engineering, but also computational biology, synthetic biology and so on. The key thing is that we, we use living things. So wetware are living cells. So everything that we do involves the use one way or another as living cells as the agent of fabrication. And living cells are amazing at fabricating materials. So the broad question that I ask of my students and, and my colleagues in the group is, can we grow a building? So that's our aim. Our aim is to grow a building. Ultimately, that's what we want to do. And that's quite challenging. So we have to take steps up to doing that. So our group takes what we, we might describe as a, a biology first approach. So our expertise is really in wetware, much more so than hardware and software. We dabble in those other areas, but our interest is in living cells and what living cells can do. And we're, we're looking not only to whether we can grow a building, we start with a principle that in architecture, we tend to we, you make, them, make use of the materials that we find in nature, but we usually harvest those materials after the organism is dead and then fabricate with them. We want to fabricate with the materials and importantly with the agents that create those materials while the materials and while those agents of creation are alive. So just as uh, in hardware, if you're a hardware expert in architecture, you might work with robot arms, or if you're a software person, you might work with Rhino or Grasshopper or other things. We work specifically with microbes and fungi. Um, we, we're, our main expertise is in microbes. I'll so we'll talk about a little bit about fungi because this is an area that we're, 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 we're getting into now as well. Uh, but those are our, our agents. And, and so those are our, our means of fabrication. So what we do is to classify our fabrication techniques into four categories that are derived from the, the, the natural systems that we use. So the first is constituted. By constituted, I mean materials that are made of living cells. So they're made of the cells uh, themselves. Produced by living cells. So living cells make the materials, but then they're exported outside the cell membrane and become part of what we call an extracellular matrix. So they live outside the cell are induced by living cells. And that means to say that the cell makes a change to its environment that makes the materials assemble, but that assembly takes place independently of the cell. So it's happening outside the cell. Um, and I, I, we, I'll give you an example of that. It involves chemical inducing of materials. And, or are made active. So the fourth category is made active by living cells. So where the cell forms a composite with another source of material, where that material is given an additional function by being part of the cell composite. I'll give you an example of each of these um, as we go through that are relevant to architecture and can be scaled up for architectural scales. 
So let's start with, so we'll, we'll start with the first one, constituted. So the, the most obvious, and I, I think probably of all of the materials that we use, this is probably the material that's, the biological material that's best known to architecture. Outside, obviously, the use of wood and the traditional biological materials as a living material, this is the one that has been studied uh, most of all, and for good reason as well. So um, mycelium, if you, you don't know it, is the root network of fungus. So the mushroom that you might eat um, is only really the, the tip of an iceberg when it comes to the, the, the organism. Most of the organisms exist in a complex and often quite large root network uh, that, get, that, that, um, uh, that harvests nutrients for the organism. It grows very quickly. So this complex root network can grow on lots of wastes. Um, we grow it on wood, wood, sawdust and coffee grounds, for example. It grows very quickly. And then it will act as a binder for the material. So it becomes part of the material itself. So the roots become part of the material, but it also acts as an, um, a binder for whatever it's, it's growing with, whatever aggregate it's, aggregate it's growing in. It creates bulk material very quickly. So you can grow this stuff very fast within a few days or a few weeks, you can grow serious amounts of the material. And it's got some interesting and useful properties. Um, Probably the most interesting for architecture is it's a very good insulator. So it's been proposed. And in fact, there are a couple of startup companies, probably more than a couple now, actually, that are trying to make insulation material out of uh, mycelium. But it can also be used as a structural material. And the, probably the most uh, important example of a mycelium based architecture is the one on the right. It's the Hi Fi Pavilion by a company called The Living and by David Benjamin in New York. And these compressed bricks are made out of mycelium grown on waste and then they're compressed and then they're built and they're, they're load, load bearing. So it's an interesting material. It's a very low energy to produce. Um, and because it can be produced on waste, it's a very attractive um, building material potentially. So the starting point for our group, given that there is so much work on mycelium, is to think about what we might do that's a little bit different from those other groups, again, taking a biology first approach. And so to do that, um, I, I often introduce our students to the idea of uh, to Louis Kahn's quote. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Louis Kahn's quite famous uh, in studio for um, saying to his students, uh, if they were um, if they lacked um, in um, uh, um, uh, if they lacked inspiration for their design project to talk to the materials. And so he would say, you know, you ask the brick, what do you want to be brick? And the brick will say, well, I want to be an arch. And so the, the, there, there goes the dialogue. And we like that idea of talking to our materials and what might our materials take. And there's an, an additional, um, uh, an additional uh, element to that when your materials are living. So we asked my Slim, do you want to be a brick? And so, so given David Benjamin's made them into a brick, do you really want to be a brick? Is that what uh, mycelium wants to be? And the answer is no, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So the images I'm showing you on the left are, are from work of one of my PhD students, Dylan Oskan, who's been looking at um, the patterning of these uh, mycelial roots. So depending on the conditions, i.e. what you grow the root network on, uh, the air, the amount of moisture, the... the um, uh, the air, the amount of moisture, the, uh, the, the type of substrate, the, the temperature that you grow them on, all of these different things will change the way in which the material grows, will change the shapes of the, the root networks. And then from that, we can derive different material properties. So the same essentially material fabrication technique can derive many different sorts of material properties. So you can get a denser network of roots, which gives you a denser material, for example. You might get a more open network, which might create a better insulator for you. Um, you might get different colors or different textures or different patterns of the material growing. So depending on the technique that you use, you can get all of these different range of material properties. And one of the things we're thinking about is actually trying to formalize these processes a little bit more so we can understand the relationship between the conditions of growth and then the morphology of the root network and then map the morphology of the root network onto the material um, outcomes that we're looking at. And then what you can do with that, this is work of an undergraduate student actually, is to, to scale that up. So this is a full-size chair. Uh, it's actually derived from an Ikea chair. So if you've seen the, these folded plastic Ikea chairs that you can get, so what it is actually is the mold, is that has been used as the mold for this casting. It's a monolithic casting, so it's been done in one go. So it's been packed with one substrate. It's been seeded with a mycelium. It's been kept uh, warm and moist and then extracted and then dried out. 
structurally you can sit on it so it's it's pretty robust it's quite heavy as well um but it's it's it certainly will it's low low bearing but what's interesting is that whilst it's a monolithic casting it has different material properties in different areas now um i should say that in natalia's early experiments the the material properties are, the difference in material properties are not huge but it shows the potential of this method because by putting different substrates into different parts of the cast you can derive different materials, for, you know, different material properties for your outcome. So if you think of the chair that you're sitting on, I mean, some of you may be sitting on a simple wooden chair, but most of us, like me, I'm sitting on a chair with padding. I've got steel, steel, uh, um, uh, steel legs uh, that are transferring my weight to the ground. I've got a little bit of cushioning. A chair has many different properties that it, it chair has many different properties to fulfill. But potentially, using this kind of technique, you can do in a monolithic casting something that has functionally graded properties um, because the mycelium will grow in different ways in different sorts of substrates. So we're really interested in that as a fabrication technique, actually, and there's some work that we're going to take in the next step. So the next uh, thing for us, we, we've just, uh, Monica, I said just joined us, she joined us a few months ago from NASA as a PhD student. And we've just, um, well, NASA, Lynn Rothschild at NASA has just won a project where we're looking to see whether we can use these mycelium fabrication methods for off-world colonization. So actually building buildings on other planets. It's a little tricky. Uh, there are lots of challenges with doing something like that. But the idea that Monica has is that we could build whole habitations where we could grade the material depending on what was needed. And you might even work in habit habitations where the mycelium is providing some structural or insulative support, but also where you might keep the mycelium alive such that you could grow uh, mushrooms, for example, for nutrients and sustenance. So you could, you could actually have combined living buildings in this way. And she's embarking on some experiments that are quite far reaching uh, quite, and quite early, um, but have really exciting potential for very um, novel construction techniques. Um, yeah, maybe for other planets, maybe not. So the next category of material are materials that are produced by living cells. And so uh, materials are produced by selling living cells, just to remind you, uh, they're made by the cell but they're ultimately exported outside the cell. They become part of this extracellular matrix that become part of the environment. The one that we're really interested in is cellulose. So cellulose is a, an interesting material anyway. It's one that we're very familiar with in, in architecture. We use cellulose through, or at least a cellulose a lignin composite in wood. Um, it's a complex material, but very useful, it has some really interesting properties. There's a microbial version of this, um, sometimes called nanocellulose or bacterial cellulose, which is much simpler, but it's a much purer form of cellulose. So um, it gives you a, um, a, 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 and again, a material with a really interesting set of properties that can be modified in different ways. So traditionally um, in design, um, it's been experimented with as an alternative to leather, for example. Um, people have used it uh, for things like wound dressings or beauty treatments. Um, particularly in its aqueous state, so it absorbs water very well, so um, it can be used there then. Um, and other sorts of product, pro, um, products potentially as an alternative to plastics. Um, but the current fabrication methods as we have them are quite limited in scope. So the, the base material and your way of creating it is roughly the same um, in these different versions. And there are different versions. And if you're interested in this, by the way, there are versions that you can do of a cellulose creation at home you don't need a lab to do this so there's there's things like the scoby method and the kombucha method where you you ferment a tea and you get the skin that you can then harvest and then dry out to become this material but we've been thinking about how we can work with the biology to go much further and actually scale up this material potentially for architectural applications but also to again make it functionally uh, more interesting so sorry about this um the video that i'm about to that I'm showing there is is probably running really badly via Zoom. I'm sure it's stuttering and and you're not seeing it in quite its um, smooth glory. But what you're seeing there is the design. We just won this project and we started it two months ago. So this is a bioreactor and a 3D printer. So what you see on your screen is um, a tube fed, fed with a media, food, and a bacteria into a into a volume of a bioreactor. A projector is mounted above it and, and fe feeding into the projector is a 3D model. So what happens as we zoom into the, the bioreactors, we've got two types of bacteria living in there. So we've got one bacteria, the big green rod shaped things are 
uh, cellulose producers. So in that food, they will produce these, these polymers, those polymers self-assemble into the skin and the skin then becomes the, the basis of the um, cellulose. We think that by getting the right conditions, we can grow quite thick clumps of this stuff. And then we've got another type of bacteria in there, which is genetically engineered to be optogenetic. So they, it responds to light. And in our initial study, what we're trying to do is to make the bacteria respond to light by changing its pigment. So we leave a pigment, it leaves a pigment behind um, as it exposed to light. We then take slices through the model. We project those onto the surface of the cellulose material. And we, uh, we change the section depending on how the cellulose, we call it a pellicle, how this tissue pellicle will grow. And then at the end of it, you dry out the material. And the idea is that you can open up the material structure and you're left with the trace of a 3D model. So that's kind of cool um, in its own right. It's an interesting thing to be able to do. And so we started that. So we started engineering the E. coli. And you can see on the, the right there, you've got a very faint trace of that, that purple pigment from the bacteria. The one on the right has been exposed to light, the top right hand corner, uh, the one, the, the little agape on the left has not. Um, but the key thing really is that this could be part of another material process. So once we've established that we can grow this sort of, think of it as a, like a living tissue, we can have different inputs to the process. So rather than just changing the, the, um, the color, changing the pigment, we might be able to make other materials form. So for example, we could get mineral crystals forming in very specific places within that material. We might be able to create an enzyme, again, a, a bacteria to produce an enzyme like cellulase. Cellulase breaks down cellulose. So we can actually break down the cellulose as it's being produced selectively in particular places. So that could be part of a system. So imagine like you might have a 3D printer, but doesn't do what a normal 3D printer does and extrudes out a material. You feed it, it grows the material, but the patterns of light that you shine onto the surface of it alter the material as it's being grown. It's a long process, so it's not quite as quick as 3D printing. So uh, we think that the, the kind of thicknesses of cultures that we want to grow will be two, two or three weeks um, at least, maybe a little bit longer to grow fully. Um, but it's a really interesting and potentially very low energy way of creating really interesting functional materials. And um, we're also then projecting that forward as to what might happen in an architectural scale. And this is the work of uh, two of my students, the, the, particularly though the work of Sun Ben Lee, who's been looking at whether we could scale up such a process to grow membranes on buildings, for example. So you might have a facade that grows and then you shine lights at it or you treat it with different chemicals as it grows. And it's a little bit like tissue engineering, but tissue engineering at the architectural scale, right? Which seems like a really, really interesting idea. So we're trying to get the principles for that. And, and that's a two, two year project that we're, we're just about to embark on. We've just embarked on, in fact, we started a couple of months ago. Okay, so my third type of material is induced materials. So these are materials that are not made by living cells, but form because of a chemical change made by the living cells. So the one that we are most interested in and the one that most obviously has architectural relevance are biominerals. Um, so um, mineralization, biomineralization is used extensively in nature as a way of creating very um, uh, high performing materials with very low energy input. So think of shells, think of uh, as calcium ca carbonates and because calcium phosphate in your bones. This is how we create rigid structural materials uh, in nature or how nature creates rigid structural materials. There is also a microbial version of this. So there's a microbial biomineralization. And it's really interesting whilst again, it's much simpler. So think about cellulose, we're working on a, a version of cellulose that's much simpler than wood. We're working on a version of, bio, version of biomineralization that's much simpler than shell construction. But um, it, it is also quite useful. And, and already there have been uh, researchers who've explored microbial biomineralization um, to create things like self-healing materials, um, but also to create cements. So biomineralization works because the, the microbes produce an enzyme uh, as part of their metabolism that will change the pH of their environment such that if calcium is present, 
calcium carbonate crystals will form. So if you can create the right conditions for the microbe, it will give you the chemical conditions to create effectively a cement, but the cement that's, that's, that's forged at room temperatures and pressure, so it doesn't need a huge energy input. And if you can do that, you can create, so the, the example on the top right there is Hank Yonkers, who has a sample of material there that contains microbial spores. So little microbial um, seeds uh, encapsulated in food. And uh, that provides the, the, the um, aggregate for the material. And then when that material cracks, water will get into there and the water will then um, uh, um, uh, 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 act as a soluble, uh, the, the food will be soluble within the water. The bacteria will then unsporulate, so they'll come alive, they'll regenerate, and then they start that microbial process of biomineralization and the cracks will re reseal. Um, and that's a, it's a proven method now. In fact, there is uh, Hank and among others is starting up companies making um, cements and um, concretes in this way. And then the bottom right is a biomason uh, company led by Ginger Dossier, formerly an architect. I mean, still an architect, as far as I know, um, but who's created a company making biocements as a, an alternative to concrete, effectively. So her company made bl bricks and blocks using this biocementation technique but not to as a self-healing agent, but actually to create new cementaceous material. So using it as a way of binding sand together to create a new cementaceous material. So there are challenges with the, the, the approach that they're taking, and it's not complete, and, not, and I can talk in more detail about that if you want. But again, we're, we're thinking about how we could take that further. And so can we make that process intelligent? So that, that and we call it MICCP, so microbial induced calcium, carbonate precipitation, can we make that intelligent in some way? Can we make a process that uses MICCP, but in response to the environment? And so um, the idea that we, that, that I, and this is really my entry point into this field, was an idea that I had that um, with bone, for example, if you're a runner, um, say you're a, a marathon runner, then you're, the, the, the bone density you have, for example, in your shin bones is much greater than the density that the normal population would have because your bone is remodeling itself and responding to the forces that you're placing on it. And so my, um, my thinking was, well, can we get microbial cement that will respond to forces placed on it? So if you had a material, you replace force on it, it would strengthen itself in response. And so initially uh, became part of a grant um, called uh, Computational Colloids that I led a little pilot and then a, a larger grant called Thinking Soils. Um, and so just to, I could talk all day about this project and there's lots to, to, to think about there, but we've started with uh, firstly identifying whether there is a pressure sensing mechanism within bacteria. So it, actually we discovered that no one really knew whether there was a way in which bacteria could sense mechanical changes in their environment, or at least not the sorts of mechanical changes that we were interested in. So the first job that we did was to search for ge a genetic response to pressure. We then translated that genetic response into an engineered bacteria. So the image that you're seeing, um, the, the sort of green blobby things that you're seeing there are bacteria that are producing a, a protein called GFP or green fluorescent protein. Think about it like a light switch. So what we've done is to find a gene that we think is responsible to pressure. We've then engineered the bacteria so that when that gene fires, it also makes this green fluorescent protein. And so the image on the top of the two blobby green things is one where the bacteria is not under pressure. And you see it glows slightly, but when we put the bacteria under pressure, it lights up. And so we know that we have a pressure sensing gene. And then what we're trying to do is connect that to the process, the enzymes that we need to make the biomineralization happen. So the image on the bottom there, um, there just underneath the green blobby things are bacteria rods, the same sorts of bacteria rods, but that roughness on the surface are calcium carbonate crystals forming around them. And so what we have is the, if you think about it like a circuit, we have the circuit that creates those enzymes and we can turn the, that circuit on and off as we want. And that what we're trying to do is make the pressure sense input translate into a, um, uh, an output, which is um, uh, um, making calcium carbonate crystals. So far, so good. Then we need to scan, scale that up. So that's fine, but that's an electron microscope image and an optical microscope image. Uh, that's not an architectural scale thing. So this is work of uh, my PhD student, Thora, who's just coming to an end now. She's been looking at how we can build more larger biocemented structures this way. We've gone to the point now where we can cement volumes about the size of a coffee cup. 
And she's learning all kinds of interesting things about how you cast this sort of material in ways that are very different to the way you might cast a normal cement type material, for example. And that's worth a um, work. And she's just published an interesting paper on this that I can refer you guys to if, if you'd like to read it. And the other area of this is to, to then scale up even further than that, and that involves developing new computational tools. Um, so the image that you're seeing on the right is um, based on a, um, uh, a computer model uh, that I built that maps um, stresses through a material to the genetic response of bacteria. And I won't go into what all those little cubes mean, but it involves developing a, a novel visualization technique as, a well, as well as a novel modeling. Um, process. And in fact, most of the, 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 the major publications we've had from this field are on the, are on the computer model. Apologies. That's my, probably my wife, Tony, she's on the way home. So, um, so yeah, so we've got, um, uh, uh, we've got those processes there. Um, so why? So the, the ultimate aim of the project is to do something like the top right. So the top right image there is an odometer. Um, in it is a jelly. And in that jelly is a bacteria. So we're going to three dimensional culture of jelly. And what we want to be able to do is to put that jelly under pressure. And as we pressurize it, it will begin to mineralize. So it will resist pressure by responding, remodeling itself in response to that load. If we're able to do that, that's a completely new class of material, a type of material that really has not been seen before. And we're edging closer to it. We're expecting to be able to get to that demonstrator by the end of this year. So that's the, the, the hope. And a lot of the core independent bits of science are now getting ready. It's putting it all together that's going to be difficult. Why might we want to do that? Well, so the, the pitch that we've made um, and the, the example that I've often given as to what you might do with such a material, whether it is or not, is, is, is I think an open question, but um, is uh, something like a self-constructing building foundation. So imagine that you are building a building rather than digging a big trench, filling it with reinforced concrete um, and then building on top of it. You could put our um, bacteria into the soils have them respond to the loads as the, the soil as loads, the, the soil would remodel itself then and build you a self-constructing building foundation. <coughs> Pardon me. Whether that's the right way of going about building building foundations is another matter, but that's an idea of the kind of thing that you might do with this stuff. So this is just to suggest that we've got a lot of publications in this area and it's worth, if you're interested, having a look at one or two. Particularly the bio, um, inspiration and biomimetics paper is probably the best and the best one we've written on this so far back in 2018. Okay. So active spore hygromorphs. Um, so this is active material. So just to recap, these are materials that are made active by the inclusion of living cells um, as a composite material. So um, hygromorphs are reasonably well known in architecture now. Um, I'm referring here to Akin Menger's work again. Hygromorphs are materials that change their shape in response to water. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, the best known um, hygromorphic materials in, um, in architectural design are based on wood, um, in particular wood laminates. And so the theory is that um, wood will absorb water and it, as it absorbs water, it will expand. Um, if you attach an expanding wood laminate to a, a, a non lam you know, you laminate it to something which is not hygromorphic, which won't expand. What happens is one, as one material expands, the other will, will bend. So you get a bending motion. Um, and so you can use that as a, both a sensor and an actuator. So the hygroskin pavilion that you're seeing there is by Akin Menges, and those little flaps will open up as they dry and then close as they get wet. Um, so it's, it's really interesting because if you think about it, for those of you familiar with active building systems where you have things like, and I know in the, 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 my office, we've got these louver panels that will open and close and they're connected to a digital sensor and servo motors and all kinds of things. And any part of that system can go wrong and it involves a lot of energy to open and close these things. And the beauty of this is you've got both your sensor and your actuator in one material. It's low tech. It's pretty robust. Um, colleagues at Newcastle have demonstrated that you know you can you can put these in a relatively harsh environment and, and they will survive. Um, so we've been working on a version of these materials, but using microbial spores. And so um, it's been discovered there was a paper in 2014, and then subsequent papers on this. And this is in nano, uh, Nature Nanotechnology. There's there's been sub subsequent papers on this process as well. It works on the same principle, but it uses bacteria spores, which are the seed form for the bacteria. 
um, a particular type of bacterial spore, which is then put onto the surface of uh, some layer. Um, we use latex, um, where the spores are the active layer and the latex is the passive layer. So the latex is not hygromorphic, the spores are. As one expands, it pushes the other and you get this bending motion, you get this actuation. So it works in the, in the same way, I mean, almost exactly the same way, actually, as the hygro skin pavilion wood does, but it works at a lower scale and it's much more sensitive. So it's very, very sensitive to small changes in um, humidity. And so what we do is, um, so we've been thinking, well, this is really interesting, this very sensitive material. So can we scale it up to building scales? Can we do something useful at a building scale? And this is very early on, but the breakthrough actually came from one of my undergraduate students who took on the challenge of working with this material and worked with these little latex strips. So the little strip you're seeing in the bottom right of the, of the image there is, is about two centimeters um, across. And what she did is to establish that you could um, place the spores on this material in a way that allowed them to self-assemble across the material. So they became very even. And then she could program that response. So she could program it quite accurately. So she would be, able, and, and the more layers that she applied, the stronger the response that she got. And this would be very sensitive and happen within a few seconds of humidity changing. So the, the video, which I'm sure is pretty clunky for you guys, you're seeing at the top is that response, that change. That's been sped up about two or three times. I think I've forgotten how much you sped it up by. So it's, it's not an instant response by any means, but it's pretty quick. And then what you can do is get these, these, um, uh, these actuators and then attach them to a, a to, to kind of serialize them, make them part of a bigger system, in this case, like an origami system, where what they're doing is they're making something fold and open and fold, close and, and open. This is a really nice biotechnology to use with our students because it's very simple to understand. We can take our students into the lab. They can have an experience doing some basic microbiology, but actually can then design scaled up um, concepts using this material. This is one of my favorite from the past, past few years. Uh, an undergraduate student, Vincent McDonald, who, who designed this whole um, uh, kind of pavilion structure with these hairs that would open and close. And the idea being is it was part of a, um, a dance studio. So you would, as the dancer moves around, generates body heat and moisture, uh, the, the walls begin to interact and open and close and allow and light and all that kind of stuff. We've, we've had some really interesting design concepts and we're working up to, to scale that up at the moment to see how, how we can actually make that part of a building scale installation. And Emily's working on that now. So just to kind of um, to, to begin to bring these things together, um, the key thing also is that each of these cannot be considered necessarily separate material types. So the key idea for me is to try to integrate all of these things to build single material systems, to build single material systems, which, um, um, which, uh, 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 yeah, to build single material systems which uh, integrate all of these different things together. And I think this is the key to scale up really. Would you mind if I take this call to tell whoever it is that I can't make? <laughs> Hello? 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 Um, I'm in the middle of a, 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 an international lecture at the moment Hello. and you're live. So do you wanna? Can you put Tiffany on mute? I'll be on the phone because I'm gonna ask you to get to meet. It's okay, I can do that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, fine. Bye. That, that was my cooking instructions for this evening. Sorry about that, everybody. Is this being recorded? This is going to exist on a video somewhere forever, isn't it? It's going to be, please don't share this and make it into some kind of weird meme. So, um, so yeah, yeah. So the idea is to, to integrate all of these things together. So the software, hardware, and wetware together to make new fabrication systems. And we're thinking in that those terms already. So project that I'm working on at the moment, um, so this is a grant application I've just written. Um, it, we, we've codenamed Multimicrobial Manufacturing. It ended up with a, a much more boring name than that because we, we took it in a slightly different direction. But the, three, the M3 project, 
is to actually develop casting methods that use microbes to help make complex materials at scale. And I mean, at architectural scale, make structural materials this way. And so think about these things as a bit like bioreactors, but, but uh, containing parts of tissue engineering, also robotic manufacturing, also more traditional casting methods as well, all together. And one of the things that I do, uh, and I, I suppose is, a, is my architectural background gives me the capability to do, is to develop, um, I think, quite compelling stories boards and graphics for our design ideas that allow me to communicate to my scientific collaborators the overall vision of what we're trying to achieve. And this is often a very good way of scrutinizing your project ideas because once it's made real, you can say your biologist says, well, you can't do that or you, you're not able to do that. So we find this method really helpful. So whenever I'm planning a new project, one of the first things I'll do is to do scenario boards that look a little bit like this and um, that sometimes feel a little bit comic book style. And it's a good way of engaging with collaborators and doing that. And it's a skill that I think we have, that visualization skill that we have as designers is really important. Um, and the other thing is to think about design concepts. So for a long time, I've held back from uh, speculative design of any sort. So I'm really determined to get my, my hands uh, into the science to really do the core stuff that, that, that is required to make these things. So not to think of, not to envisage something that I can't then ask if I can build. But more recently, and as the group has grown, we've started to develop many more design concepts. And as we've got closer to the materials and fabrication techniques, we've started to use uh, a degree of design speculation as a way of trying to drive us forward a little bit. And this is very recent, actually. So this is a, a piece of design work that I've done in the last um, couple of months. Um, it hasn't really seen any light of day, not for any particular publication, not for anything other than as a way of thinking through some of the fabrication strategies that I'm interested in. So this is a, a bridge uh, that I've designed that uses as its influence the diff, some of the different material strategies that we've got, different some of the different material types and so on, and thinks about how they might be translated into a form which is both functional but also expressive in some way as well. And this is also involves using different sorts of modeling techniques. So uh, using um, uh, um, uh, computational modeling methods that are, that, that are um, I guess, uh, uh, more advanced than you might find in, in um, sorry, no, no, we rephrase it, computational modeling techniques that are not usually applied to architectural problems. So this includes sort of biological modeling, biological simulation, but also things like physics simulation that give you emergent properties. We use a lot of particle systems and so on in CAD software that allows us to simulate flows and interactions between particles and agents. These sorts of ways of modeling, which are much more like we find in biology. Um, and there are people who are doing this kind of work much better than me, it must be said, but it's something that we've started to explore more recently and I'm quite excited about. We've, we've got a few different new design concepts um, uh, in development at the moment. So I asked the question of can we grow a building and the answer is no. So that's typically it. We need to scale up yet. But we think that integration of hardware, software and wetware will allow us to make very novel sorts of materials and fabrication systems which, which we can um, which we can scale up for architecture and we think that we're, we're getting closer and closer to to some real uh, larger scale pieces now and potentially that those materials may be living um, beyond the beyond construction and responsive to their environment ultimately so just in the last minute I might just permit myself one more minute just to just to uh, just set a slightly different agenda for you guys as well um, I talked about the research themes, and one of the major research themes is microbial environments. And um, this is not my research theme, but it's one I've been very interested in. I originated it, so I, I felt it was really important. Just to explain to you, the, the origin of microbial environments was um, there, there's a growing an, uh, interest in the, what's known as the microbiome. So the microbiome is the sum total of the microbes that surround us effectively. And we, we, have, a, we have an inner microbiome, so your 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 stomach, for example, is full of a microbial community that helps you digest food. Your skin is teeming with lots and lots of microbes, most of which are very good for you. But unfortunately, bacteria and microbes have had a bad rap. So we go and clean our house, we clean ourselves, we try and get rid of them. And it's recognized that actually that process of cleaning takes away um, um, 
some of the healthy benefits of the, the microbial environment it actually can have quite detrimental effects on health, particularly it's been connected to things like childhood allergies. So there's a thing called the hygiene hypothesis that you know, it's been tested by looking at children who have been brought up in farms and in, in rural environments, for example, are often very exposed to dirt. And those who are brought up in city, very clean environments and showing the difference in the rates of childhood allergies are much greater from those who live in clean environments. So we thought that one of the things that we're going to have to think about in the future is how to design our environment with our microbiome in mind. And then we got COVID-19. So now, of course, we're all cleaning all the time, everywhere, cleaning ourselves, our surfaces, everything, keeping away from one another, not sharing our microbiome, because viruses are part of our microbiome. Um, so that's true. That's, that's important. But um, we didn't want to, we, we, so we had to start to rethink what that theme might be. So we bought as part of the hub all of this new sequencing kit and uh, DNA sequencing kit and very quickly got commandeered for what we call the COG program, which is the way in which we identify um, uh, mutations in the virus. And then we track those mutations through the population. This is really important. And I, you all know this already. I don't have to give anyone a virology lecture because we all armchair um, epidemiologist scenario, but um, this is what we've been doing. So we've been spending a lot of time, or our group at the HPB is spending a lot of time tracking these variants, taking in lots of uh, sequence data and being able to do this kind of stuff. And it's incredibly rich source of information, actually. We can track viruses in some instances, even to individual rooms and neighborhoods. So we can actually track how a virus is run because there are small mutations all of the time. We've also worked with a company called Oxford Nanopore. And so um, Oxford Nanopore make a sequence. And our sequences doing DNA sequencing used to be a multi, multi million pound task. It would involve dozens of research groups working together for a single organism. Now you can have something which is about the size of a USB stick, which plugs into your computer, just like a USB stick, which will sequence your environment for you. So you can put a sample in that and it will tell you exactly what species are living within your environment and this is being used increasingly in our testing in the, the testing strategy the international testing strategy things like this and this is a real game changer for 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 dna sequencing so what covid19 has taught us is that that firstly our microbial environment is incredibly spatial the relationship between us and the microbial world has massive implications it can it can change our lives significantly and we're all living through this right now we don't need to i don't need to persuade you of that that we're networked through biology that there is already a network out there a social network that exists through the, the microbes that we share and we see that mapped out in these viral virology networks the biological cells, as we know from our research, can sense and respond to their environment. And they're also incredibly robust. They only require the energy from their environment. They don't require any uh, input. And so our thinking increasingly in this is that the future of the built environment is going to be is, is going to be focused on an internet, not only of digital things. And so those of you who understand smart cities research will know that we, we talk a lot about the internet of things and so on, but it's an internet of biological things. So our environment is going to have to be able to sense, respond and integrate with its bio, with the, the, with its biology in ways that I don't think we've even fully uh, envisaged or understood yet. So future environments are biologically enabled. So I wanted to leave that as a as thought for you, because I think for many of you looking at your careers in architecture, I think this way of thinking is going to become increasingly prevalent and, and useful to you. So I'm going to finish there. I'm a little over time. I'm about five minutes over time. But um, just to say that if you, you want to see any uh, of our work, we've got couple of uh, websites the main website is bbe.ac.uk where that's the main research hub and then we've got uh, i've got a website called symbio.construction which was my previous research group we haven't updated it for about a year now i guess give or take but it's got an awful lot of material like videos of our students work and um uh, um uh, lots of um um, uh, uh, promotional videos for different projects and project descriptions and links to our research papers and all that kind of stuff. So it's still a, a decent resource and it's still online if you want to go and see it. And I'm always happy to take questions from people. So, so if you've got an idea or you want some advice on something, then fire an email through to me and I'll, I usually respond reasonably quickly. So thank you very much. I, that brings me to a stop. I'll stop sharing my, my screen there. 
I can see two of myself. That's weird. There we go. I'm stopped. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. This is this is great. I can see sort of, you know, um, uh, people being very excited here and, and clapping their virtual avatar hands. So um, uh, that is that is fantastic. I'm so glad that we found you sort of, you know, last year at one stage, like uh, um, uh, we sort of dig through literature and, and the net and so on. And uh, it's it's in, uh, incredibly inspiring, um, uh, not just because the work is exciting, but I think it's incredibly inspiring um, uh, because there is, in fact, an architect out there who made it into the hard sciences. Um, and I feel that this is a, um, uh, this is a challenge uh, which both disciplines, in a way, are kind of scared of. Um, one barrier might be the, the language, like architects talk differently about things than uh, uh, the, the, the natural uh, life sciences. Uh, it also has to do with um, how we communicate, like our um, presentations are usually quite aesthetically quite pleasing and beautiful. Uh, and that sort of um, uh, uh, misses out some information on the actual stuff so I'm, I'm very very glad that that we found you as an architect in that sort of uh, uh situation working on these amazing projects um now i would like to uh ask the um the students to uh to, to ask questions or to uh, to, to comment and i see that uh, i have a few questions as well but i would like the students to go first um and there's uh, maram um, uh, maram please please go and and ask your questions also in the chat but you could uh, possibly um phrase your question uh, by just asking it um and opening up your microphone yeah, thank you so much. First of all, um, thank you, Martin, for the amazing lecture. Super interesting information, but I had like a thought maybe, maybe you can answer the question of mine, um, because I was wondering the applications of these innovations in materials, they are still limited in small scale projects, for instance, pavilions, um, but we cannot see like small, like larger scale um, applications like uh, hospitals, um, commercial buildings, etc. So, what I mean, what do you think about that, and why uh, could be the reasons behind that? Yeah, no. So, so, so scaling up is one of the biggest challenges that we have in 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 this kind of technology. And so, I mean, I, I I've got a, I, there there are quite a number of complicated reasons for that. But I mean, the first thing to say, quite straightforwardly, is that this is still quite early. I don't know whether you're familiar with the technology technology readiness level chart. You know, you go from from TRL one to 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 nine, I think it is on the NASA one. I don't know what so the European one is slightly different, but um, essentially. Uh, when you, you you know to do a kind of mission critical building like a hospital for example you really need to be at nine right you, you've got to you've got to be there we we tend to work in my group in TR, trl level one to three i would really love to be working at least four or five and so we're trying to push an awful lot of our stuff to that but uh, it's very early stages and a lot of these technologies are in their infancy there are some inherent um, challenges to scale up that we have, and there are some um, e easy, re easy solutions there. I mean, some of them are just about the fact that, you know, we don't produce huge batches of bacteria cellulose because nobody's really found the reason to do large, you know, building scale batches of it. In theory, microbial processes, I mean, brewing, brewing is a microbial process and people make plenty of beer that way. So there's no reason why we can't scale up in that sense. But microbial communities are often quite delicate. So scaling them up is often a bit of a challenge. So it's not just about by building a bigger vat. It's actually about a different set of conditions and so on. So there are one of the reasons we've one of the things we've been thinking about in the group is moving also to us. So another thing, and it gets very involved. So I, 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 I don't know how much you'd want to go down this track, but when we're dealing when we deal with the micros in the lab so with the, the cellulose project for example or the, the biomineralization project what we tend to do is that we're taking bacteria from the environment that live 
in naturally in large communities where those large communities afford them protection and 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 um, uh, and uh, provide them with resource and actually to, the way of thinking about microbes is not as single celled organisms but as actually multicellular organisms that are dispersed so we are single we are multicellular organisms clumped together these are multicellular organisms that disperse and seeing them in that way completely changes their way of going. So if you take one of them, one type of microbe out of the environment, and then you focus it on your industrial process or whatever it is, it's not happy in, in some senses. So, so one of the things that we've been thinking of doing is that really to scale up, we're going to have to reintroduce the idea of multimicrobial environments again. We're going to have to start working with the kind of systems and environments that microbes live in already and place them back within those contexts. And so there's some really interesting design challenges there for us in the way that we design with them. But I think that I, I guess my conclusion would say it's early days for this kind of research. I think that's the, the real key. And I measure the success of our projects actually not necessarily by TRL, but by the size of the thing I can produce. So I, it was a huge victory for me when I can get out of an electron microscope and it's something I can see. That's, that's a really big starting point. But we're, we're, we're edging up. We're edging up the scales. We're getting there, but it's going to take time, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um... Martin, uh, I would like to, uh, Mohamed has a question, but I would like to um, follow up that uh, uh, that question of Maram. Um, that's kind of a bigger discussion really, but um, do you think it's worthwhile for architects going down that challenging route full of passion, but also full of probably, um, Paces that would not understand what what you're doing there as an architect. Um, because as, I mean, I know this when I tell people I'm an architect. Sometimes they are like, "Oh, that's great. Where did you study informatics?" I'm like, no, no, I'm an architect. I'm I'm not like a like computer a scientist, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so do you think it's what do you think? Because it's a um, it's a risk. Right. I mean, interdisciplinary work is just such an incredibly high risk. Um, but how do you feel? Like, I mean, because there's also a CETA with Phil Ayers, there's like the, the uh, biology, um, some biology department in, in Graz, where they're kind of uh, collaborating. Um, and, and some people in the US, I mean, Michel Joachim is, is far away from the hard sciences, but he's also working on this. So what, what do you think about that? Or what do no. you advise your students as, as, as well? Because it is really risky to advise students to go a certain route and then sort of... Yeah, don't tell my students that. I hope none of them are here. I'm just thinking now that I'm, I'm rude for... We, it is a risk. You, you're, you're, in a sense, entering a field that doesn't yet exist as a, as a, in, in formal terms. But it, it, is, it is growing very quickly. And so, I mean, biodesign broadly speaking, so not just architecture, but other fields of design and interest in biology is, is, is definitely gaining um, sub, you know, a sub, substantial following. We're very involved in the biodesign challenge uh, in the US, the BDC, uh, the BDC guys um, are convinced that biodesign will be uh, a part of every design school within the next decade. That's their kind of their 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 belief. Um, certainly, my my first um, PhD student, Carolina Ramirez Figuera, who she was the real pioneer, really, because she did the PhD a PhD in biodesign, but when we didn't have a lab for her or any of the setup, and frankly, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, she came out with it with microbiology skills. She got she she was in at one point in a bidding war between three institutions who wanted her as a postdoc. And she's now a lecturer at the Royal College of Art. And so she there was a need. And actually, we struggle to hire. So postdocs who have that particular range of skills, we're desperate for. And I'm just waiting for my PhD students to come up with that range of skills. So we feel that things are heating up, that there's an awful lot of work in this area. I think um, bio, biotechnology is probably where digital technology was maybe in the 1950s or 60s. And so, so you know, you don't see, you didn't see a lot of computers in, in architectural practices then. 
but the speed of development of the field is such that I think that it might become more and more relevant. And so it's a risk, but I mean, I've, I've worked on the basis of risk worth taking, I would say. Thank you very much. And thank you for comparing that to the 1950s, because we just had a little talk, which I gave on some of the beginnings of the, the computation. And uh, of course, there's uh, always uh, uh, Gordon Pass with his electrochemical uh, computers, or uh, Nicholas Negroponte, um, uh, and uh, of course, the, the idea of, uh, of, of, of design of a brain by Ross Ashby. So the very sort of beginnings of, uh, of that work. So uh, I think that's super relevant that you said that because then the, the, the just by having listened to some of the, the, the words that I said, like, you know, two hours ago in, in, in the lecture, the students have an idea now what 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 you're doing, right? So where it is, and um, I think that is that is uh, the, the, the parallel is right. This, I, I mean, that's, so. that is, I mean, because those though that research, and I've been really influenced by that stuff as well. Right? That that research was done at a time when it seemed pretty crazy to be doing that kind of stuff, and now it seems like it was exactly what you needed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, like the Goebbels Goebbels in that. Uh, uh in, in in the machine right sort of uh, self-organizing a city in a way that that was crazy and now we are uh, simulating these things with uh um algorithms based on on, on swarming um uh Mohammed has a question about uh, mycelium maybe i just read this that's a bit quicker can you illustrate more uh, uh regarding the sensation to the different climate conditions of mycelium yeah it's, 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 do, do you want to elaborate on that so it is you want to know about the relationship between the morphology of the 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 the, the um root network and the conditions that we grow them in is that right no uh, thank you yeah because i read more about uh uh using uh, mycelium and making uh like uh with a wool respiration and bricks and uh, um uh some industries and the using uh, a mycelium and uh, infrastructure uh, it, it's very wonderful about uh, making this lightweight and also it's a, a fire resistance and uh, very hard uh, it's a wonderful material but i won't have you see about it's a sensation with the climate it's a, maybe a, a good sensation or a negative or positive sensation like uh, humidity and the changes in uh, and weather between uh, winter and uh, summer. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, we, we as with all of these things, and it's, it's a, an interesting question. We 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 all of the experiments that we conduct are in quite close quarters within a lab within within an environment that we control quite heavily. Uh, what? Yeah. The, the mycelium thing is really interesting. Um, we think that the way forward with mycelium is to make it into an in situ material. So an in situ material that you grow on site. I think that's the real victory. Most of the models for use of mycelium as a building material have it done in a factory and then you ship it onto site. And there are good reasons for doing that because that environmental control you've got is uh, is is right. But if you can match the mycelium with your climate, with the conditions of what you're, you're working with, that might well be a, a way of making it a super um a super in situ material we have this phrase radical vernacular which is a kind of biological approach to its environment what do you use that you can find exactly where you stand right so um i think that would be interesting I mean, in terms of the studies that have been done with environmental conditions and mycelium i can i can Maybe if you um, send me an email, I can give you a Dropbox folder with some papers that we've collected on that that topic. Uh, that might give you some insight. I don't think there's been a lot done on. There's been stuff done on, you know, things that you can grow within a bioreactor and adding different, you know, more moisture, less moisture, more temperature, less temperature. There hasn't been a lot that looks at climatic condition. So I think that might, you know, there's a whole research area there potentially that, that could be very interesting. Uh, but I can sh share with you what we found so far anywhere. As I said, I have a good Dropbox folder that we, we've we been um, collecting with all these papers and I can, I can give to you. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Okay, Let's just take uh, one more by, by Dua, um, who's also from Manzura University, uh, asking about the composite. So, Dua, you can uh, please go. 
Okay, uh, my question was about could it be the start of building or growing a material be aided by the materials we usually use now, like wood, for example, or it has to all be grown from scratch by the materials you discussed in the lecture? So is this a question about retrofit then? Is it a case of can you, you know, yes. grow on existing buildings as it were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any yeah. So this is this is a really really interesting um, a really interesting question, and it's come up quite a bit recently because we went. I gave um well actually I didn't do this. I gave a, a one of my colleagues gave a presentation to an the Institute of Engineers who are um, uh, in the UK, and they they came at the end of the presentation. They said, "Oh, this is also very very exciting," um, but you realise that in in fifty years time, something like eighty percent of our building current building stock will still be building so you can do all the new flashy stuff you want you're not going to solve a lot of problems until you can address what we've we've gotten so we do we do have some ideas in that regard and so a couple of the ideas that we've been thinking are with the mycelium for example the possibility of this in situ stuff that i was talking to to muhammad about um the idea is that um, you can, we might be able to say, so if you've got a cavity wall, or if you've got a wall, you can actually have a subsequent growth to give yourself within an existing structure to give yourself more insulation. Uh, that carries some challenges because uh, mycelium is also known as dry rot. So because it'll, it'll eat through wood. So if you get it in your house and it's growing in your window frames, for example, you've got some problems there. So it's not always a good thing, but there is some ideas about that. I also have um, a colleague of mine called, um, Magda um, Theodoradou, who's uh, looking at the use of microbes to um, uh, to heal stone and to give stone self-healing properties in um, ancient historically important buildings. And so what you do is you apply uh, a microbial solution to the surface of these stone materials and the microbes, will, the microbial solution will seek in sink into the stone and into the top surface of the stone. And then as the stone gets weathered, we get that self-healing so we get that um, property and the material can self-heal and and it can be done in ways that are very um, respectful to the building so it doesn't really change the way the building looks but it gives it this self-healing capability and she's one of the pioneers in this field now we, we hired her a year or so ago uh, as one of our fellows and she's working on this so there are some areas where we think that working with existing buildings is going to be quite quite um but yeah possible for sure Great. Do we have time for one more question, Martin? You do. I'm, from my yeah. perspective, I'm happy to. to okay. I, I have to do dinner in about half an hour, but that's fine. I'm, okay. Uh, Let's do with that one question. Then I would like to open a discussion with um, uh, some more uh, possibly provocative uh, ideas. Um, Mohamed uh, Egas is asking a question. Mohamed. Uh, yes, I'm asking regarding uh, microbial microbes included inside the material itself. I mean, this microbes could be evaluated on different way or has a new behavior which is not studied already. I mean, it could be developed somehow in a different way. That's why I'm asking how it could be evaluated later if this happened. So the question is, can you can you make the microbes do something that they wouldn't ordinarily do in in nature? So can you give them a new function, as it were? Is that? No, I mean that microbes could be evaluated uh, evaluated in, in a different way than we studied inside the lab itself. Ah, so you mean that you 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 have an organism that does something, you let it out into the world, and then it evolves to do something completely different. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, I'm, I'm absolutely so so so. Um, it's it's really interesting because uh, uh, microbes in particular evolve very quickly, and so there are examples that my science colleagues will tell you where you put a microbe in the the middle of a plate, and the the microbes at the side of the plate, when the, the colony has grown, are genetically different to those in the center and that's how they you know they, they evolve they also share de genes and all kinds of crazy stuff that um sorry my son is now now trying to yes there's a, there's a in the kitchen. okay don't worry about it i'll sort it out if you can find something else i'm in the middle of something at the moment this is the problem with homeworking this is just this is just, i could be in my office right now but sorry i can't deal with a mosquito now i'm pretty sure it's not a mosquito we don't have mosquitoes this time okay well, don't worry about it. Okay, I'll, I'll sort it out later. Don't worry. 
So, so, um, so yes, there is that possibility. And I have to say that this is the, I, there is a line in our, we, there is a sense that I think there's a, a moment where you cross a barrier, where you take a genetically modified organism out into the world. And um, it's not a line that we're going to cross anytime soon. Legally, we, we wouldn't be allowed to anyway. Um, but I think there are reasons to think that that's a step for many too far. I actually wrote about the ethics of this in my book. So I devoted a chapter to what I call the designs of the natural and talked about why it is that genetic engineering, for example, is what we describe as a deep technology. And a deep technology is something that's fundamentally different to the way that we've tra treated technology before. And I'm a believer in the deep, deep technology theory. I think there is something palpably different about what we're doing. So a lot of the applications for the things that we do involve engineering organisms within these constrained and confined environments. And we, we have things like um, we, when we make genetic modifications, we put in switches that mean that the bacteria have to live on very specific food stuff that we give them. They can't escape from the lab. We have protocols to make sure that can't happen. And there are lots of industrial processes that already use microbial, microbial, um, um, microbial, uh, microbial, uh, sorry, there are lots of uh, processes that already use genetically engineered microbes in chemical processes and things. So, you know, it might well be that you, the shampoo that you use this morning or whatever has been derived from a chemical process that has come from a, a, an engineered biological source. But you, you, the bacteria is not in the shampoo, so you, you they separate out. So that we, we, keep, we stick to that at the moment, that rule. But I think there is very deep questions about the nature of this technology and in, in when it becomes part of our environment, if indeed it does become part of the environment. And I think we need to make a very clear case of why it should be and how we would mitigate against the kind of challenges that you're describing. And it's a really interesting discussion and one we could have quite a long debate about, to be honest, like one of these things that, that um, it's, yeah, you need to sit down and have a long conversation over a big cup of tea and, and, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Thank you. Excellent. So Stephen, uh, Stephen Johnson's emergence book is sort of coming uh becoming reality here so yeah. uh there's a, there's a great book for everybody it's called emergence by stephen johnson and um i think it came out beginning of the 2000s is that it's right? yeah, it's been uh, but I, I do recommend that also to to everybody because there's it's, it's kind of strands of of thinking uh, and understanding the world, uh, which which will change your decision making completely as as uh, as architects and and designers when you start seeing the world systemically uh, based on uh, the the phenomenon of emergence, uh, then um, uh, you will take different decisions in your design processes. Now I have I have actually. Um, in a way, sort of a personal question, because I've been dealing with this, uh, with this difference between uh, biological computation and uh, computational biology since I came across Heinz von Furster's biological computer, computer lab uh, in the 1970s. Um, and um, at one stage, uh, I, I sort of had the, the um, Healing, or I was sort of observing that uh, biological computing and computational biology are somehow merging, uh, especially through um, the application of particle dynamics and physics engines uh, as, as a sort of, you know, in silico simulation possibility for what's happening in, in bio. And um, I was wondering how what, what do you think about this or how, how do you call this what you what you're doing working with the biology because you're programming these things right i mean you're you're creating little software packages um with wet computers yeah there's um yeah this is a really interesting question so which <laughs> angle do you take it from? sorry <laughs> yeah you know so so, so it's, it's um, a list question yeah, no, but it's, it, so I think it's the heart. So synthetic biology is based on the idea that there's a wetware, the wetware, the program of the wetware is DNA and the, the hardware are proteins and the, the living cell. 
that uh, and I do talk about this a bit in my book as well but but that is a metaphor by the way if anyone wants my book I can send them a free pdf so let me know I, I know that there are people asking things in the 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 comments and dropping their emails the easiest thing to do is to email me directly with your question uh, the, if you if I promise to paper or something and I'll send it straight to you I might not get all of the comments before we leave but um the so, so the, there are a couple of things to think about. So one is that that idea of the wetware analogy with hardware and software. And so um, uh, there is a very, there's a very commonly used image in synthetic biology of an open cell with electronic components in it. And then this idea that the DNA is your software. It doesn't really work like that. And, and that's what, one of the things. So anyone who's been spent any time in the wet lab knows that you don't code anything for a, for a bacteria. A bacteria is pretty it has its own agency it's not gonna it's not an open software platform you can use and i think that that way of thinking about things though quite prevalent is beginning to die out and in favor of another way of thinking of biology as potentially a computational medium but in a broader sense and and that involves a different way of thinking not about necessarily the relationship between the hardware and the software and this is something else i talk about in in the book but as a relationship between a number of, um, I call them, uh, I, I use um, a, a, um, a, an evolutionary biologist's term, which is the creode, which is the creode is the necessary path. And so you get these necessary paths forming, right? Um, so this is a very good way of thinking about it. And then the, the creode itself is formed by a combination of environmental factors, is formed by genes to some extent. It's also formed a lot by the specifics of interactions of proteins. And you have a very complex network that you're looking at. And then you can start to pull and push at that network and do things with it and then end up with um, results and out, out, you know, uh, additional things that uh, additional outputs that might might meet your requirements or meet what you're trying to achieve. Often you don't. So that's one side of this. The other side of this is just how powerful computing is getting as a way of modeling biology. And so there is a, a paper that came out of the uh, Craig Venter Institute, which is a landmark paper that takes the entire genetic code of um, E. coli and can predict from genotypes, so from the specific genes, the phenotypes, so the interactions of those genes to make proteins. Um, it's heavily computational, but it shows that you can predict, at least at the level of a single cell, using a computer model of a single cell, what it will do. And there are sing similar things, I think, happening in neuroscience with neural networks and so on, where we're getting closer to these models. Whether in silico, this is the way it's described in the literature, is ever a good stand-in for in vivo. It's quite another matter, though. And it's fine when you've got a single-celled organism, relatively simple, incredibly well-known, in a particular condition that you understand. But the moment you change any part of that condition, the computer becomes useless at predicting what you're going to get. So, so there is a, a somewhat of a convergence. But if it makes any sense, even as we converge, it feels like those domains are drifting further apart to some extent. You were just realizing that actually that what we're seeing is convergence. There's still the thing is a lot further away than you thought it was to start with. So it may be going in the right direction, but it's not it's still not very close. I think it's a great challenge. I mean, for research, it's fan fantastic because you're a long way from the answer. But um, I think we we there's a lot of things that we need to rethink, I think, in biology and computing that that way. And probably in architecture and urban urban design, how our cities, how we transform our cities, or uh, it's an extremely it's an extremely exciting time at the moment, and um, uh, I'm very glad that uh, that we have such a large number of, of students here as well who are interested in that uh, in that topic. Um, that's wonderful. So um, I would say that um, we kind of leave that here with an open question uh, like that's possibly for the students to to tackle in their in their reports uh, as in um, uh, how does that all change our our cities and and uh, architectures um, and, and when does this big speculative uh, become like the real I think that's uh, that's quite interesting to to learn about as well uh, wonderful. So, well, thank you very much, Martin.
Um, it was such a pleasure to welcome you here. It would be much better if we could sort of, you know, have a conversation in, in person um, and, and discuss these things left and right. Uh, but I'm sure the time will come. Yeah, soon. soon. Maybe, maybe we find like a sort of a clever Erasmus or something maybe. Uh, exchange thing. Yeah, um, yeah well, and thank you very much. And thank you again. And, and as I say, feel free if, if any of you, if I promised a paper or, or suggested some literature or you want a copy of something that I've said, just send me through an email. It, it generally takes me a week or two to, to respond to everybody, but but I can I will do that. I'll keep an eye on things and send you those if, if, if there's anything specific. Great. Thanks very much. Excellent. Well, have a great evening. And uh, the students can stay uh, for a little longer uh, so that we can wrap up uh, today's, uh, today's session. Thank you, Martin. Take care and stay healthy. Same to you. Bye. 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 Ron. Okay, great. So thank you very much, uh, Peter, as well.